Oh, great. We've hit 12 o'clock uh, Eastern time, U.S. time. And as I mentioned uh, last week, we're now starting the last sequence of the IPAC seminar, and we have a sequence of four lectures by Peter Brandon of KTH, uh, talking about some of his great work with Chu and Hugh on Laurentian polynomials. So go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. And uh, so, yeah, so this is based on joint work with Junha and Jonathan Leake. So the first part, I guess, well, the very first part is an introduction. So I come from, uh, from uh, I approach Lorentzian polynomials from uh, polynomials that are, that are, that are um, defined in terms of uh, their zero sets. And these are stable polynomials, but you can also approach Lorentzian polynomials from algebraic geometry, which is what June Hurt did. But June Hurt and I, we joined forces and so out came these Lorentzian polynomials. But uh, so this is the introduction where we talk about stable polynomials and see how they are, and then we'll see how they are related to Lorentzian polynomials. But, um, and then, uh, but in a recent work with Jonathan Leake, we realized how to generalize this work to, uh, to Lorentzian polynomials and cones. And by doing that, we can, we can also sort of, we can prove uh, the, for example, the hiram rota welsh conjecture, which you cannot prove by just Lorentzian polynomials. So we'll give a, an alternative proof of the, well, um, an elementary proof of the hiram rota welsh conjecture on the characteristic polynomial of the matroid. And uh, before that, we will prove give a Lorentzian proof of Mason's conjecture, but we'll start this series by, by talking first about stable polynomials and then talking about the theory of Lorentzian polynomials on cones. And I gather that in this seminar series, we should prove, prove stuff. So my intention is to do that. We'll see how, yeah. if That's I Absolutely can. right. We wanna see the details. And also, for, there's some probably some new people here. Uh, I just wanted to mention again that the format here is you can interrupt at any time, and you're almost encouraged to interrupt at any time with a question. So it's more of like a interaction. Okay. Yeah, I would like that too. Okay. So then I guess I'll start if I can manage. Yeah. So I'll start talking about stable polynomials then. But first, uh, maybe a motiv motivation for why to study these classes of polynomials. So in combinatorics, we're interested in sequences of numbers. So maybe this is too small for you, is it? I think that's no. okay. That's okay. Yeah, size-wise, yeah. Yeah. So we take, but not my handwriting. So we have some sequence of positive numbers. And as uh, combinatorialists, we are interested in the shape of these numbers. Or, or we're interested in not where. in the shape. And uh, what do I mean by that? Well, for the simplest uh, and most studied properties, the unimodality. And this means that the sequence starts increasing weekly up to some top and then decreases. And a slightly, well, a stronger property of this log concavity. And uh, well, why is this stronger? Well, we, we can, uh, the unimodality says, of course, that, <clears throat> that AK is, uh, greater or equal to the max, or to the min, I guess. 
correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So log concavity is, is stronger. And, and even, so log concavity implies unimodality. And then we also have rerootedness. of the generating polynomial. And this is an even stronger property. And since, well, maybe you've seen this, this proof that rerootedness implies low concavity of the, oh, sorry, I missed one property. But I can cheat. I thought. So uh, uh, a property that is in between here is the Newton's inequalities or ultra ultra log concavity. saying that if we normalize by the binomial numbers, then this sequence is log concave. And this is a stronger property because uh, then, uh, then log concavity, well, since the binomial numbers are this, themselves log concave. So if we divide by them, we get a stronger property. Okay, so the non-trivial non -trivial, um, implication here is between rerootedness and Newton's inequalities, and I thought I would give a proof of that, because not only should we give all the proofs here, but, but also it, it's sort of, it's central to what Lorentzian polynomials is all about. So, so how do we prove this? So maybe start. So, so right. Okay. What happened there? So we write F to be this generating polynomial, but normalized. So we take N choose K, B K, X to the K. So these. This n choose k, b k is a k. Okay, and now we can do operations on this that preserves rerootedness. So, so suppose, so, um, yeah. So suppose now f is rerooted. So by rerooted, I mean that all the its zeros are real, of course. So we assume that this is rerouted then uh, by, for example, Rolle's theorem, then, uh, then this implies uh, that f prime is rerouted, the derivative. And this is by well, freshman calculus, I guess. But, but it's also easy to see by just plotting. So if, if this is a plot of, the, of, of f, then the, we have the series of f prime in between. And there are, if we have n roots of, of f, then we have n minus one roots of f prime in between. Okay, and another operation we can also, so maybe I'll remove this. So then, so f prime is rerouted. So call this property A or operation A. And we may also invert the polynomial. So x to the n, f of one over x, which is then reading the polynomial backwards. So it's, um, yeah. 
noting that n choose k is symmetric. So this is also reviewed because the roots are the reciprocals. So using just these two properties. So, okay. So now I'll cheat again. Sorry for this. And we note that F prime, we, we, we may write this as n times okay so we so f prime is a pol or f prime divided by n is a polynomial of the same type the type just we shift the, the b case so, uh, so using these operations, so using A and B, well, we can deduce that. So we can, we can then isolate three consecutive uh, coefficients in any window. So, so we can deduce that, uh, that bk minus one, so the two, so, so we have of course two choose zero here. And two choose one, bk x plus then this is rebooted. Because we can, yeah, by differentiating and then, then switching if necessary, we can al always get down to this polynomial. So taking the, the, the discriminant, we see that bk squared is greater than bk minus one times bk plus one. So this is then uh, one way of proving log concavity and unimodality by proving Newton's inequalities by relutinous. And there are several examples of this in the combinatorial literature. Well, one of the most studies are the Eulerian polynomials. And we have matching polynomials and Rook polynomials of different kinds. And uh, well, orthogonal polynomials are all, are all rerouted. We have characteristic polynomials of symmetric matrices or Hermitian matrices. I wrote it in Swedish. So these are common examples of these rerouted pol polynomials of, of in combinatorics. But this also, the, the method of proof here is that we sort of differentiate until we get down to quadratic. And as we will see later, this is also sort of the characteristic of, of Lorentzian polynomials. Everything happens in the quadratic regime. So we, in some way, we reduce everything by differentiating down to quadratics. Okay. So <clears throat> what is it? So I guess when, when working with, with rerouted polynomials in combinatorics, so what we, we often have sort of more structure than just a sequence of numbers. So it's natural to look at uh, multivariate polynomials that carry much more information and, 
and it, that, that also lets us uh, um, define uh, finer recursions and, and prove stuff. So, so it's natural to seek out a, a, a multivariate extension of real routines. So this is what stability is. So it's a multivariate analog of real routines. So how do you define it? So we first define it for with complex. So we're going to be interested in in multivariate polynomials with real coefficients, but it's more natural to to talk, of, talk about stable polynomials with uh, complex coefficients. So, uh, so a polynomial so say a polynomial call it f with complex coefficients now is called stable if if it's non-zero whenever all variables have positive imaginary part. So they all lie in the upper, the open upper half. And if it's, if F has real coefficients, we simply call it real state. If in addition, yes. So what examples do we have? Well, for example, so let me give some simple examples just to, so for example, so this is stable. So any linear polynomial with the non-negative coefficients uh, in, front of, in front of the variables is stable. And why? Well, because if, if, uh, if the variables are in the upper half plane, then, oh, then since the sum, well, if these are in the upper half plane, then the sum of them are also in the upper half plane. So in particular, it's non-zero, right? So linear polynomial with uh, non-negative coefficients in front of the variables are always stable. So uh, another example would be maybe x1 times x2 minus one. And why is that? Well, one way of seeing it is that if you take two, two numbers in the upper half plane and multiply them together, we can never reach the positive real axis, right? Because they're, the angle is uh, less than pi. So we can never re reach the positive real axis. Another, reason is that we can write this as x1 times um, <clears throat> x2 minus x1 inverse, right? And x1 
x1 is non-zero when it's in the upper half plane, and then negative x1 inverse is also in the upper half plane. So taking the sum of these two, we'll take us in the upper half plane. Okay. So, and, and why is this a univariate, well, a multivariate uh, analog of rerootedness? Well, so a simple fact is that if, oh, well, if, well, f is in, has a real coefficient, then f is stable if and only if it's rebooted. And this is because since it has real coefficients, any non-real zeros, they come in complex conjugate pairs. So if it's supposed to be non-vanishing upstairs, then it better be non-vanishing downstairs. So all the zeros lie on the real line. So non-real zeros come in, com uh, in conjugate pairs. So stability is really a, a multivariate or real stability is a is a multivariate extension of rebootedness. Another and property reflection downstairs in the upper plane will also be stable if you start with a stable f of negative x. Yes. If you have real coefficients then you you may negate all the the um, the variables. That's true. Because of the same reason. Okay, so this uh, being stable is a closed property. So, what do I mean by that? Well, well, what I mean is that if you have a sequence of polynomials of, say, bounded degree, so that we don't, you know, risk of getting a transcendental entire function, then uh, if all the, the members, well, if we have, if fk tends to f, say coefficients wise, so an fk, say, uh, the degree of fk is bounded for, the, then f is stable. if all the f case are stable. And this is not very hard to see, I guess. It's so, so, so based on the principle that the series of the polynomial uh, are continuous functions of the coefficients. It's sometimes called Herbert's theorem, I guess. I think. Yep. So, so it's a closed property. So, but and a very important class of stable polynomials comes from determinants. So uh, another example are the determinantal polynomials. So this is polynomials that are expressed as determinants or of linear pencils of matrices. So So where are these a1 through 
a n r positive semi definite so they have only non negative eigenvalues and are symmetric or are positive well we can just okay assume that they are hermitian so where these a1 and through a and are pos positive semi definite hermitian matrices of the same size and a0 is is just hermitian so how do we prove that well the idea is that we we just so we know that the the characteristic polynomial of any uh, of any symmetric or, or Hermitian matrix is real rooted. And so we just have to sort of verify that. Yeah. These are also hyperbolic, so they are stable. Yeah, we won't talk about hyperbolic polynomials very much. Uh, during this series, but but it's that's one way of, of seeing it. But anyhow, um, how do we prove this? Well, <clears throat> well, one way of doing it is uh, we write these. So so right. So we, we may assume by by this since. Stability is a closed property. We may actually assume that these AIs are positive definite, right? Since we can always approximate uh, positive semi-definite matrices with positive definite matrices. So we may assume, so let me stop. So we, we may assume that a1 through an are actually positive definite. Okay, so how do we check if a polynomial is stable? Well, we plug in uh, we plug in numbers in the upper half plane and see if it's non-zero, right? So so we let let now xj be some numbers now in the upper half plane. So aj is any real number and and the imaginary part of bj is greater than zero for all j. Can we plug this in? So f of x1 to xn is the determinant of well we get some aj and then we we get the sum of the bjs here Okay. Oh, by the way, Peter, do yeah. you want the imaginary part of BJ positive or just BJ positive? Please. Ah, thank you. <clears throat> That's a mistake. So, yeah, so I, I've already taken out the I there. So BJ should be positive. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So now, uh, so now this, we have now a sum of uh, uh, a positive sum of positive definite matrices here. So this is positive definite again. So we, we can write this as the determinant of A plus IB where but this is where B is positive definite. 
Okay. Well, if B is positive definite, we could go, well, we can always write this as, well, B is, we can write this as B is equal to P times P transpose where P is an invertible matrix. Right? So, ah, I have a complex. So, <clears throat> so, so if we, so we can write this, I guess, as the determinant of B times the determinant of, so, so now I have to conjugate right. So I guess, I hope I do it right here. Ah. And then we have the identity here. Right? And this is Hermitian again. So we know that, well, I is, or negative I is never a zero of the characteristic polynomial of a Hermitian matrix. I is never an eigenvalue of a Hermitian matrix. So this better be zero, non zero, since, since negative I is not an eigenvalue. Often, often Hermitian matrix of A. Okay. So this, I guess, is the proof. You so may call me, uh, Peter. Yeah. You may also work with uh, diagonal matrices and use the density of diagonal matrices and get this right. Mm -hmm. Diagonal matrix. Yeah. Yeah. I don't see how, but maybe you could. But uh, but anyhow, so this gives a. a a large class of, of uh, stable polynomials now. Anything that can be written as a determinant of a sum of positive semi-definite matrices times the x size and A0, where A0 is Hermitian. And we call these determinantal polynomials. And there's actually a converse to this too. So in, in two variables, there's the Helton-Winnikov theorem. Which I won't prove today, by the way. Which says that uh, any real stable polynomial in, of degree D, say. of degree D, say F X Y, may be written as as the as the determinant of say X A plus Y B plus C, where where A, B, and C are actually some real symmetric. D by D matrices. And 
and AB are positive semi-definite. But unfortunately, the, the extension to several variables, more, more than three variables or more than two variables fails. So, so it fails for, for more than two variables. And this is a conjecture from the 50s by by Peter Lax, which was resolved by Helton and Vinikov like 10 years ago, maybe, or 50. Maybe. <clears throat> okay. But it's up to conjecture what to how to resolve this for for more than three more than two variables. There are several con conjectures to this. In, the, in those lines. Okay. So now I see that I forgot to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It might be useful useful to see that. So another. So. We notice that that a real rooted well a, a real polynomial is stable or real stable if and only if for all say alpha being a vector for all vectors with positive coefficients and beta could have, uh, it's, it's just a real vector. If we specialize to line through alpha, or maybe to be negative, is again real rooted. And why is this? Well, yeah, we can take, we can attain any tuple of, um, um, we, we can attain any tuple of numbers in the upper half plane by, by restricting to any line of this form. So, so this is another reason why this is sort of a, a natural extension of real routines. So it's, yeah, so it's a, a way of sort of, of reducing it to a single variable property. Okay, so now I wanna go through some more, some more closure properties. So the first one is, is immediate from the definition that if you have two stable polynomials, we may multiply them and they're stable again. So if, if F and G are stable, then so is the product. Because of course, F times G is also non-zero in the upper half plane if, if F and G are. So this is a simple but useful property. Another one is that um, we, may, we can make changes of variables. So if, if we have some vectors now, say, In, with non-negative coefficients.
and say v0 is some vector with real coefficient and f We'll do this for real state. And F is a stable polynomial. Then so is the polynomial we get if we, so maybe we have M vectors in R. Then so is the, vec the, the polynomial say in variables T1, to Tm obtained by making a change of variables. We just take T1, well, take V0 plus T1 do it in this way. Unless it's identically zero. So so of course if, if we choose all the vectors to be the zero vector, then this is identically zero. That's if you be. want uh, yeah. T sub M and V sub M at the end, you don't want necessarily the, the dimension of the space to be the same as the number of vectors. Thank you. So unless it's identically zero. And this is also but just by definition since uh, we may well we may assume that all the by cont well by continuity and because the stability is a closed property we may assume that all these vi's v1 through vm have positive um, entries and uh, in that case if we plug in if we, if we plug in numbers in the upper half plane here, then in the in 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 F all the entries will all the variables in F with have will be numbers in the upper half plane. So this is just by definition. Uh, and Peter? We also have, uh, Peter? Yep. Yeah. Uh, how about you if you transform multiplying by a matrix? Well this is essentially that, right? Uh, I didn't want to, we, we could write this as, as F is V0 times A times this vector T1 through Tn, where this is, has non-negative entries. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's how you want to phrase it. Well, another property, which we already sort of alluded to is the inversion of the of some variables. So we so if if f is stable, um, and say of of degree at most d. D in say the in x one say then uh, then we may invert that variable so we may so we take x one to the d and then we take negative one over x one here x two x three then this is stable again. And the reason is, as we said before, that this map maps the, if x1 is the, in the upper half plane, then negative one over x1 is there again, because one over x1 is in the lower half plane, but then if we negate, if, if we negate it, it's in the upper half plane again. So this, this map maps the upper half plane to itself.
and then another so I'm seeing see that I'm, I'm going slower than I thought but voila, I have four lectures uh, and, and another important property is that if um, that if f is stable and um, say v is a vector with non-negative uh, entries, then and if we take the directional derivative, what do we mean by that? Well, we, we just then this is stable again. And yeah, maybe I should prove this because this is something that we'll we will use in when we talk about Lorentzian polynomials. And it's not very hard, it's essentially Gauss-Lucas theorem, but I guess in the spirit of the seminar I should prove it, or should I? Is it kind of easy to prove? Well, yeah, it's rather yeah. easy, but it takes time writing, of course, all the time. So. But, but, but I, can, I can prove it, sketch it. So, Peter, do you want it to do you want them to be in the uh, up properly in the upper quartant uh, octant, or you can no. include zero or identically zero? Okay. But so, so what do we do? Well, we first do it. So instead of writing ddxi all the time, I I'm right. I will write di. But uh, it, it's a, we will see that it suffices to do it with uh, according, well, to differentiate along the coordinate axis. So, so we write we can we sort of we can write. We can collect all the other variables. Well, we can expand it with respect to the first variable x1. And then we see that where AD is not identically zero. So D is the degree of, of F uh, in x1. So then, uh, <clears throat> then first, we, we, we need to prove that AD itself is a stable polynomial. Well, so what is AD? Whoops. Well, it's the limit as say T goes to infinity. Um, Sorry. So we yeah, we might write, write it. There's going to be a right because. If we plug in this, we, everything will die except when uh, k is equal to d. So, so by Herbert's, so here we just plugged in a, oops. Here we just plugged in a, a number in, in the upper half plane. So, so the, the polynomial here is gonna be stable itself. <clears throat> and then we, taken the limit and 
as we said, taking limits. Well, the, the stability is closed under taking limits. So this is this is stable by this Herbert's theorem on the continu continuity of series. So then we we well we need this to know that this sort of the that if we take the derivative with respect to 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 x one that we don't um, well. So what is it? So 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 it suffices. So we will prove that d f d x one is stable. So it suffices to prove that to prove that for if we if we fix some number say a2 if we fix some numbers in the upper half plane then um, say g prime of x where g is is now this polynomial where we have x in the first coordinate and then a2 a3 to an that this is stable And I, I wanted this first property that this is stable because I, I wanted this to, the, this g of x to have the same degree for all for all inputs of a two to a n in the upper half plane, and this is guaranteed by this property that a d is stable. Okay, so then, uh, well. So, so G of X itself is stable because, well, we've plugged in numbers in the upper half plane here. So if we plug in another number in the upper half plane here, it's certainly non-zero. So G of X is stable. So we may write it as, as the, well, some constant times Product. Pardon me, do you want g of x to be f of x, x. a to a3? Yeah, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, and so also, the, g of x is the restriction. Yeah. It will, we've just restricted all the other variables to in their upper half plane, and then we just vary the first. And when you're expressing a d as a limit, you're going to have a power of i in there. I mean, it doesn't affect yeah. the stability, but there should be a, an i to the yeah. d in the front, right? Yeah. We will get yeah, i, I to the d. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't. Yeah. To avoid confusions, maybe we call the latter b a's, uh, b2, b3. Uh, a2, A3 into B2, B3, because you have used AI speed. Ah. Yeah, but that's understood. Ah, oh, thank you. That's very unfortunate. Yeah. Sorry for that. Okay. So since G of X is stable, we may factor it and it's a univariate polynomial. So we may factor it in terms of its zeros. So, so these zeros then lie in the, in the lower, since it's supposed to be a non-zero in the upper half plane, it's these uh, numbers lie in the lower half plane. And now G prime of X, we, we, 
we look at g prime of x over g of x, and we know that this is maybe written in this form. Right? And if we plug in, uh, we plug in, so let, so let now x be in the upper half plane. And we plug this in. So then uh, if we look at the imaginary part of this g prime of x over g of x, well, it's the sum of the imaginary parts of, of these. But, but this, um, oops. But these numbers now, since uh, since uh, since zeta, since this number zeta j here is in the uh, lower lower half plane, and x is in the upper half plane, then x minus zeta j is in the upper half plane. So one over it is in the lower half plane. So this is. So the imaginary part of this whole thing is negative since, since these are, since x minus zeta j is in the upper half plane. Right? So, so in particular, it's non-zero since it has negative. So g prime of x is non-zero. So this shows that, this then proves that dfdx1 is stable. But on the other hand, so, so this, well, so, so hence dfdx1 is stable. So to get, so now if, if v is any any vector with positive uh, non-negative coefficients, then we, then we know an f is stable. Then if we look at f of x plus some new variable, say x naught um, v, since this is a change of variables with non-negative coefficients, this is stable again. So this is a polynomial, so let's call it G of, or not G is not a good letter. Let's call it H of X zero, X one through X. So then since this is stable, we know that the H dx zero is stable again, and we can set X zero to be zero. This is also, a, an operation that preserves stability. And this is dBf. D, this is the directional derivative of f. Or identically zero. Okay. So these are the closure properties. And uh, I guess I don't have very much time, right? Yeah. Um, by the way, if you need another lecture or two, that's fine from our end. I don't know what, uh, yeah. what your schedule is like, but. Um, we'll see. But so, so what I wanted to do next was to give some examples of then, uh, stable polynomials in combinatorics, so the multivariate Eulerian polynomials and polynomials that are related to matroid theory. And then, uh, and then go into Lorentzian polynomials and see the connection there. But I guess uh, we have to postpone this to until next time. So next time we'll talk more about the 
more about Lorentzian polynomials and uh, the supports of Lorentzian polynomials, how they are characterized by, by, by matrix theory. So it will be more combinatorial, I guess. But this is just sort of, yeah. And, but we'll see how, how the theories go, go in parallel. This, this, the theory of stable polynomials and the theory of Lorentzian polynomials. So maybe, yeah, if there are some questions about today's lecture. Any questions for better? Um. Well, one kind of a naive question, why are they called stable polynomials? It's a good question. Well, it comes from, uh, from control theory about you know, stable um, systems of uh, differential equations with constant coefficients, I guess. So they are usually stable in the, is it in the left? Um, Herb is stable, meaning in, in the left half plane. But, uh, but, but, but for some reason, people also talk about stability for the upper half plane, and it's borrowed from, from yeah, from that terminology. Hmm. Thank you. So they should be called upper half plane stable. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other questions today? Okay, great. Well, let's thank Peter and we'll uh, see you on Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. See you all, everyone. Bye. Thank you.